I'm Isabella Kaminska, and I'm the editor of FT Alphaville, which is the Financial Times' markets blog. Uh, we're going to talk about the power of money today uh, and the banking industry more specifically. I'll start with the question, are the banks more powerful than they've ever been? That is a very good question. Um, on one hand, no, they're not. Um, I think we saw that very clearly this week because we saw quite a lot of fluctuations in the so-called market for funding, which was a demonstration of the power of regulation since uh, 2008. Uh, so much so that the big, to, especially the big, too big to fail banks, they're not really willing to take on the risk to, in, like, to manage the imbalances that come up in the temporary funding market. And that really um, is a new thing. Um, but on the, at, at the same time, their, their monopolies haven't yet been entirely broken. There's obviously a lot of challenges coming in on the fintech side of things. Um, but none of those have yet really demonstrated that they can make a profit. And one of the big problems is that because of all the regulation we have imposed, the cost of becoming a, a competitor in this market is huge. Because to, to establish yourself, you have to manage, you have to overcome the cost of regulation. So in a funny way, the banks have been constrained by regulation, but that regulation has also made it much more difficult to compete with them. Is the regulation as it stands adequate enough to stop what seems to be an incoming recession? Um, I don't think, you know, it, the reality is, is that um, back in the days, at least before 2008, uh, recessions were not seen as entirely linked to the financial sector, right? So what was happening in money markets and finance was actually seen as removed from the core economy. Recessions came and went, and then banking crises came and went. And it was very rarely that the two were intertwined very intimately. I think what was un unique about 2008 was that um, the banking crisis coincided with a massive recession, obviously. So um, whether, whether the power of the banks and, and where we are today with the regulation and, and an incoming recession, it's not very clear. I think there isn't probably a recession coming because these things are cyclical. But um, the, the most important thing to say with respect to the banking sector is that it is fairly resilient. Um, there was a lot of like um, speculation this week that with the stress in the funding markets, we'd be seeing all sorts of like uh, names uh, falling or be, you know, becoming insolvent. But that's just not the case because the regulation has made it so that the banks are very well capitalized, almost too well capitalized, so well capitalized that a lot of that capital can't be being reinvested in the, in the further economy. So should people not be worried about a financial crisis reoccurring in the short term like 2008? You see, what is a I think you have to differentiate what is a financial crisis to an economic crisis. So an econo economic crisis is definitely something to worry about. It means people are losing jobs. People, you know, are um, constrained on, in terms of their consumption. There's not enough opportunities for people. There's mass un unemployment, ma ma major distress. Finance, you know, in, 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 a, in a world where a financial crisis can be compartmentalized to just, you know, impacting the, the core finance um, sector, um, you know, it shouldn't really affect the rest of the economy. So if the regulators have done their job, a financial crisis should be contained and it shouldn't become systemic in nature the way it was before. And if that's the case, we shouldn't really be worried about a financial crisis. What we should be worried about is an economic crisis. On the point of the 2008 financial crisis, before we move on to potential economic crises that we should worry about, um, was the response to that adequate through the criminal justice system and also the regulations that was implemented afterwards? It's a very good question. So um, I think the average person in the public, I think, would disagree that it was adequate. We didn't see anyone really going to jail. Um, where the criminal responses, like in terms of um, the kind of legal action has really um, taken foot is in the, in the scandals that came after the 2008 crisis. So things like the emergence of li LIBOR rigging and FX rigging. Um, and there was a very strong response by regulators to that because it almost felt like because of no one really going to jail because of 2008, 
the public wasn't going to entertain this sort of market manipulation anymore. And so we did see, um, you know, a handful of cases of traders being um, accused of criminal acts and having to defend themselves, um, especially in the libel sectors. What emerged out of that is, however, were not stronger regulations. They were sort of self-regulating bodies like the FMSB, which was designed to um, improve standards in the industry. And that, I think, is something that the banks really got away with because rather than a new regulator coming in, we got this sort of light touch regulation. And I just wrote a story about how that's, that particular body is now um, in breach, potentially a breach of ethics itself, which is a fabulous I irony because one of uh, their employees is whistleblowing on them um, in terms of how um, the, the, allegedly he was pushed, uh, le lent on by Deutsche Bank to um, not give evidence in a case for manipulation. Um, and he claims that this is um, clear evidence that the body that sets standards is actually just uh, pushing uh, the interests of the banks uh, rather than defending the interests of Joe Public and investors. Um, the reason it's important is because um, if the uh, responses to the, those ethics breaches are obviously not working, then um, it's very embarrassing for, for, for Bank of England, for, for the government and for the Bank of England who imposed them, and some sort of new mechanism will have to be devised. In terms of how the banks themselves have been treated, um, one thing that isn't very well reported, because you see the settlement cases out of all the big um, uh, controversies, um, but as part of those settlements, we, ha we are seeing um, so-called monitors go into banks. So now banks are constrained not just by their own compliance departments, they're also constrained by the monitors that have been imposed upon them by the legal system. And this is effectively like a bank banking Stasi, I call it, because these are like external regulatory uh, people who are paid by the bank, but indirectly, um, they're originally paid, paid, they're paid directly by the regulators. And they sit in the offices of the bank and their job is to like, basically check the bad, bad behavior of the banks. Um, and that is a new phenomenon and, uh, and quite interesting, but the banks are already evolving in so much as they are, they are hiring their own shadow monitors to try and regulate the amount of information. I'm waffling now, but, um, but I think um, in terms of how, we are, how the banks are responding, um, that is interesting because there's always evolution in this space. And so you put in like a, an internal police effectively to, to monitor the banks and the banks just create their own sort of response to that. And it's a game of cat and mouse. I don't think that will change anytime soon. Which was a long way of saying the regulations are effective, but possibly likely to be gamed. Who better than an economic journalist to ask this next question to? Just drawing upon the example that you gave in which um, to the general public, it would appear that the regulatory boards are acting in the interests of those who they are supposed to be regulating. Um, to um, whether it's a purposeful obfuscation or a um, lack of understanding of how um, financial sectors work and how the economy works. Do you think that people's conception of um, how, in the case of 2008, um, the, the banks operate and how the economy operates would change and perhaps be more sympathetic if they just understood how they operated in more detail? I think this is, a, this is fundamental. The problem is, and it's not just the regulators, it's the police tackling cybercrime as well. So, so much, so much financial fraud is occurring uh, through the digital sphere and, and the, the regulators and the police just do not have the resources to manage this. They don't have the skill set. And any time they train people up, they get poached by the banks because it looks really impressive like at, the, at a bank that your internal security is by someone who was previously a regulator in the, or in like the uh, Scotland Yard fraud squad, right? So um, who is watching the, what? you know, it, it, it's not even the case of who's watching the watchdogs, but it's, 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 um, it's, a real, it's a real problem in society in so much as the people with the skills end up going to the highest paying jobs and the people who are supposed to watch them just can't compete on the salaries. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I don't know how you can close that gap other than appealing to 
the sort of sense of moral duty of people in the private sector to come in and, and operate um, as sort of expert advisors to regulators. But then there's an, a, whole, a whole host of conflicts of interest. And so you can never be sure if the man on the, on the inside uh, who is helping the regulators, whose experience comes from the banking sector, is really on the side of the regulators. It's like the mafia. And the, you know, it's no different to how, you know, criminals try to infiltrate the police. It's the same, it's the same sort of, and, and revolving, the revolving sort of corridor and, and, and a door between, between the two bodies is always quite alarming. And regulators, former regulators going to banks or bank, former bankers going to, into regulation or government, you know, it, it's, it's always going to create conflicts of interest. And I don't think as a society we've figured out how we can deal with that. So, looking through the perspective of people who don't uh, people who don't have the economic theory or understanding of how all this operates, I'm going to ask a few questions, um, and in layman's terms, I'd like you to answer them. Is the economy rigged against working class people? Yes, at the moment it is, and it's because of the way capital market formation is. Um, favoring uh, so-called too-big-to-fail monopolies um, and it, it inadvertently always discriminates against small businesses and that is really, um, the, I, I believe that's the fundamental problem in, in the economy is that we want more as Amazons, we want more Ubers, we don't want more small retailers. Now, we're part of the problem because we empower Amazon and we empower Uber. The fact that they don't make many, like Amazon famously didn't make any profit for, for a very long time. Uber still to this day doesn't make any proper, proper profit. I mean, it's one of the most loss making companies of all time. Um, but we grab the services they offer irrespective of whether they're making money or whether they're constructive for society or for labor norms and all that sort of stuff. So we are part of the problem. I think we as consumers need to be more responsible because if we didn't, you know, um, willingly take on these services that are favoring monopolies and running small businesses out of the, out of, uh, the economy, um, we would have a better distribution of wealth. And yet, as you said, Uber is one of the biggest loss-making companies of all time. So if we remove um, on a user basis um, our, our use of their services and we stop giving them our money, what's to stop them from continuing to operate and monopolize the economy? Because Uber, when Uber makes a case to investors, it doesn't care about, it cares only about user numbers. That's the main, uh, you know, uh, metric that they are concerned about. They just want to show that they have um, the capacity to grow and to uh, uh, acquire more and more customers. And if you have uh, any sort of, um, any business model that has the capacity to do that these days, you will get funded on a, you know, on an almost infinite basis until you become the monopoly. And, and, and investors will delay the profit until the point you have taken over the entire market. And by that point, it's too late. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, they're, they're, they're loss making, but they are hugely popular with customers. And even though they are generating losses, they're still generating revenues. So people are still getting paid. And that's how Uber, the Uber model is justified in the investor space. We as consumers can take that revenue away from Uber and take it to like, small, like smaller companies that operate on a local basis. Then, then that money stays locally. It stays and it you know, ends up being recycled in the local economy instead of being pilfered offshore. So yes, they're making a loss, but they're still making a lot of money, and that money is still going offshore. So on the same question of how can everyday people um, make the economy work better for them, cryptocurrency, how disruptive is or could that be, and would that help everyday people? No, I don't think it would help people at all. I think people have been entirely. I think cryptocurrency is everything bad that we've tried to constrain coming back at us. So we've just regulated the banks and made it very hard for them to, um, you know, get up to the sort of bad behaviour that they were used to. 
And instead, we've now, all those bad practices have migrated to the cryptocurrency sphere where there is no regulation. It's like the Wild West. Now, on one hand, you could argue, well, perhaps that's uh, better. There's moral hazard. People will learn for themselves when they get sort of robbed and, and, and uh, you know, pilfered. Um, there will be a sense of sort of um, under, uh, learning, a learning curve. And people will learn and become more resilient. And those models will be harder to distribute in economies. Because when there's a protection in place, like for regulation, then the argument is that consumers never get wise, right? So that's the only pro argument for cryptocurrency is that over time people will learn to uh, be more shrewd about how they're going to get uh, conned. But I still think, by and large, it's, um, it's, it's the worst of the banking system without any of the checks and balances that even pre-existed pre the 2008 system. Um, and that's not going to necessarily lead to any empowerment, in my opinion. Hopefully this interview has gone some way towards this, but what would you recommend to engage ordinary people in the affairs of the financial sector? Um, Perhaps reading the FT. I, so, so I think, um, you know, reading the FT is, is one thing you could do, um, but it's expensive and I understand why people don't want to, you know, sign up for a subscription. But I do think that fundamentally, um, the, the thing that can really improve the financial economy at large is if people become accountable uh, for their own decisions in the financial marketplace and don't let third parties take them for a ride. So I would just say you need to question everything. Never get like um, overtaken by the FOMO. Don't, uh, you know, there are always going to be suckers. But if, if the cardinal rule is, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. If you're thinking about putting your money in something and, and you're being promised all sorts of ridiculous returns, um, question that because there is no free lunch. and. As yet, we haven't figured out how to do a free, free lunch. So just question everything, read as much as you can, but don't, and, and don't feel stupid if you don't understand the jargon, because that jargon only exists to keep you alienated and, and from asking the, the really important questions that matter, which is, does this really make sense? Isabella Kaminska, thank you very much. No problem.